Welcome to freedomlovin.com, where we focus on building freedom in an unfree world. Through personal development, location independence, and passive income strategies. Now here's your host, Kevin Koskella. You got it. This is Kevin, and this is Freedom Lovin', episode number 30. And uh, I should add to that intro and say something about Bitcoin, because I'm just so excited about Bitcoin these days, and I can't get enough of it, so it's, it's definitely going to be a topic on a future podcast again soon, hopefully. And I hope that if you heard the last one that I did, which was an intro to Bitcoin with Steve Michaels, I hope you took that info and did something with it and perhaps bought a little bit of Bitcoin. I think that would be a really great move, even if you just uh, put in a few bucks at this point and just kind of see how it works. Once you get a feel for it, it really changes things. You can kind of see how, what it's like to get digital cash and to send it. It's really cool. It's like you stepped into the future, which is the future is now. So upcoming in just a minute, I have an interview with JJ Roberts of Sex 3.0. And it was a really fantastic, interesting interview. And we touched on a lot of things having to do with relationships and how people are free or not free within their relationships. And so stay tuned for that. Just a quick report here. I'm in San Diego still, and apparently I'm going to be here for the winter for the most part. So I had a plan, I think three years ago, that I was just going to spend my winters somewhere else, somewhere nice and warm and where the days are long and there's beaches and things like that. So most people think that San Diego has that in the winter, but it's absolutely not true. And once the clocks change, the weather still stays warm for a while, but the sun going down at like 445 is super annoying to me. And even if we could have like the sun up till uh, up to like 545, so it would get dark at six, that would be uh, much better. Because I, I think what it is, is that in the winter here, my energy starts to go down. So like you know, it gets dark at five o'clock and I kind of feel like the day's over, even though that's usually the time I go work out. So it's even been a struggle for me to get out and do a workout these days just because of the early darkness. And it is starting to get cold. It actually does get cold here. And it's all relative, of course. But when you're used to, you know, it's 75 degrees during the day most of the year. And then the lows are typically around 60, 65 in the summer. And then the lows start to drop. And then when you get into December, they start dropping into like the 40s and stuff like that. And so far it hasn't gotten that cold, but that is coming and you know it doesn't rain a whole lot but but we do get a little bit of winter so this year anyway this year the plans did not all come together so I am here for at least through February so I'm happy about that though a lot of good things are happening here in town so and life is good so one thing that I do want to do that I've been also thinking about for a long time, and I actually did some of this back in like 2009, 2010, is starting to outsource my life. So there's just so many pain in the ass things that, that we all do. We all like, we have to do. We have to get groceries. We have to go to the store. We have to, you know, go to the dry cleaners. We have to do our laundry, clean the house, all that stuff. I just find it's just a complete waste of time. I mean, I I feel like I go and I eat a lot. So I'm going to the grocery store quite a bit, probably two days a week, sometimes three days. And it takes a while. You have to drive there, park and uh, go walk through the store. I never know where anything is in the grocery store. So I'm always looking all around for stuff because I go to different stores. And anyway, that type of thing, like I really want to outsource. There are these services where you can get meals delivered and there's actually some paleo delivery services and they're not cheap but i am thinking that this could be something that is really worth it to have just meals ready to go maybe just pop them in the microwave and they're healthy and they have everything that you need so stuff like that and then someone to get groceries for me if i could just like go and make a list or or, or pick something from, send an email or something like that, get that done and get anything else that I need at the store, like Target stuff. I mean, I can order some of that on Amazon, like Amazon Prime, but there's other stuff that 
it that, that's not going to work for for me. So yeah, there's a lot of little things that uh, I think could be outsourced. And anyway, I've been talking to this guy communicating over email that uh, specializes in kind of the whole outsourcing thing, and he's been able to outsource a lot of his life and make things a lot easier for himself. And so I'm going to have him on the show coming up soon. I think it's the it's going to be the next one. Actually, it's going to be the one after next. So that'll be really interesting because we're talking about freedom here, and sometimes I go through my days and I don't feel all that free because I feel like I've got all these obligations, all these things that I need to get done. And then pretty soon it's like, you know, nine o'clock at night and I'm like, okay, now it's time to just like read and, and go to bed. So, uh, so I do want to increase my freedom levels because I, I'm, I know that they can be a lot higher than they are. So that's about it. If you can take just a minute out of your day and uh, give us a rating and review over here, that would be awesome. Just go into your iTunes, go to Freedom Love and Podcast in the upper right corner, type that in, and then just click on Rating and Review, and you can just uh, give us a give us a rating and a quick review, and I will read that on the next podcast. So, without further ado, here is my interview with JJ Roberts. Go out there and build some freedom, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Well, I am really excited to have J.J. Roberts on the show today. J.J. is the founder of Sex 3.0 and author of the groundbreaking book, Sex 3.0, A Sexual Revolution Manual. And his website is sex3.0.com. That's all spelled out. J.J., welcome to Freedom Loving. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, awesome. So can you talk a little bit about your background and kind of what led you to the book on sex? Well, in terms of writing, I, I kind of did freelance uh, rock journalism. I started doing that about, I guess, 20 years ago. But that was always a sideline because uh, it doesn't pay very well. <laughs> I guess my regular job was freelance computer consultant. So yeah. um, I'm used to being free and I'm, I'm never really used to having a boss. And um, I used to do a lot of architecture and design, enterprise architecture for big uh, telecoms companies and investment banks in the U.K., Actually, around the world, but you know, mostly in the UK, mostly in London. And if you do that for a couple of decades, one of the skills that you end up with is well, you sp- basically spend your entire time thinking about design. And one of the skills that you end up with is you learn how to recognize a really shitty design. Yeah. <laughs> and Sex 2.0, which is the world that we're born into and the design and the framework that we're given by society, and the one that we're supposed to use to relate to each other is a really shitty design. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of relevant. Also, I'm used to uh, designing and architecting software, which, you know, which is stuff that doesn't physically exist. Yeah. And likewise, the set of rules and the framework you're given by society, which I've called Sex 2.0, it's something that doesn't physically exist. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's a made-up construct, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then, what is Sex 1.0, and how you know how did we evolve into that or out of that? Well, 1.0 is basically it's about 98 percent of human history. If you take a look at say the last 200,000 years. 1.0 is the last 200,000 years up to uh, roughly 8,000 BC. 2.0 is 8,000 BC up to and including the present day. So, in other words, the last 10,000 years. And 3.0 is present day forwards. Okay. How did you come up with those years? Well, 200,000 years is roughly the amount of time we've been anatomically human. Right. So, in other words, without going back to our ancestors without going back uh, to, you know, uh, Homo habilis and, you know, our previous ancestors. You can go back millions of years if you want to keep going back through our ancestors. Yeah. But for the last 200,000 years, we've basically been anatomically human. Uh, 10,000 years ago is when we started to go through the agricultural revolution, and we invented the concept of property. Mm-hmm. So one of the key things to understand about 1.0 is human beings were hunter-gatherers. We lived in bands or tribes of maybe a few dozen people, maybe 30 to 50 people, anything you know. beyond that would be a fairly big tribe. And that's a very nomadic existence. You're always moving because, of course, we didn't grow our own food. We didn't farm our own animals. We just gathered fruits and vegetables and we hunted animals. So we were, mm-hmm. we were bands of roaming hunter-gatherers. And when you're always moving, any property that you owned, you'd have to carry with you, which would slow you down yeah, and would lower your chances of survival, not increase your chances of survival. So essentially, for almost all of human history, human beings, we had no concept of property. We didn't live in towns, villages, or cities, and there were no, thing, no such thing as countries. Mm-hmm. 
this is 95, 98% of human existence, roughly. So that's 1.0. Yeah. And then we moved into the sex 2.0. Well, the 2.0 era started, like I said, roughly around 8,000 BC. We started in what we now call the Middle East. We started to go through the agricultural revolution. We started to become farmers, and we started to move away from the uh, the hunter-gatherer paradigm. And for the very first time, we invented the concept of property. Mm-hmm. And the very first property was, of course, land. Right. Because now land becomes um, a survival resource because we need to farm the land, we need to tend the land, we need to farm animals, we need land to do that. And as a byproduct of inventing the concept of property and land becoming a survival resource, it started to become very important for men to start to treat women as sexual property. Mm -hmm. And so this is when marriage came about then? Uh, this is the beginning of the move from 1.0 to 2.0. Right. Marriage is roughly about 10,000 years old, but that predates the earliest written records. Human written language is only about 6,200 years old, roughly in the middle of the, the 2.0 era. So essentially the first marriages were verbally bartered agreements where women exchanged sexual exclusivity in exchange for security. And uh, the reason behind this is because once you have the notion of property and property uh, land is a, a key survival resource, men need to know that they're passing their own property down their own bloodline mm -hmm. and their own survival resources down to their own children and best ensuring the survival of their own children and not somebody else's children. So, essentially, because only men experience paternity concern, women can have sex with as many men as they want, and they always know that they're the mother of the child. Right. Because of the self-evident nature of childbirth. Right. You know, she may or may not know who the father is, but she always knows she's the mother because it came out of her body. And men have never had that luxury. And in 1.0, it didn't really matter because, first of all, there was no property to pass down bloodlines. And second of all, the, the unit of social organization was the tribe. The circle of empathy that people had was for everybody else in the tribe, which essentially means that children were raised by the tribe, not just by the blood mother or the blood father. And with no property to pass down in 1.0, it didn't really matter tremendously who the father of the child was. And in many cases, you wouldn't know anyway. Yeah. No particular reason to worry about it in 1.0, but in 2.0, now that you have the concept of property, and property is a key survival resource, and of course only men can experience paternity concern, which is the worry that they're raising somebody else's children and passing property down somebody else's bloodline. Mm -hmm. That combination of things moved us from 1.0 to 2.0, and now a new system of control needed to be invented to deal with this fear that men had of passing property down bloodlines. And that system of control has a name. Mm-hmm. Marriage. <laughs> marriage. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, essentially, the, the first marriages were verbally bartered agreements with women exchanging security in exchange for the promise of sexual exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how would you say that's worked out over the last 10,000 years? Pretty poorly on the whole, because first of all, a promise of sexual exclusivity is not the same thing as a guarantee, is it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the research that I've seen suggests that, I mean, 2.0 as a framework in terms of guaranteeing paternity for men has what's politely called a 20% rate of, well, the polite name for it is paternal discrepancy. Mm -hmm. In other words, the guy who you think is your daddy is not really your daddy. Yeah. So a 20% failure rate is fairly high. So that's, as a, re that's really high. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> when you think about yeah. like two out of every 10, it's, it's, yeah, it's someone else's kid. Yeah, I, I've seen, I mean, these obviously percentages like that change from culture to culture. Yeah. I've seen estimates as high as 30% and mm -hmm. estimates as low as, say, 2%. Yeah. The problem is that widespread social testing to find that percentage would introduce some severe social problems, let's just say. Yeah. But it's uh, it's thought to be around 20%. Right. And it had the move from 1.0 to 2.0 had a lot of uh, very negative side effects on the way that people related to each other. Mm -hmm. like, like what kind of side effects? Well, when you're born into a 2.0 world, which we all are, of course, because 2.0 is 8,000 BC up to and including the present day, yeah. you're raised 
your entire life by society to believe in what's called the sex 2.0 deal. There's two sides to the deal, the male side and the female side. If you're a woman born into a sex 2.0 world, you are raised your entire life being told that you have to sell your sexuality in exchange for security. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the security of marriage to a man. And that's the female side of the 2.0 deal. And the male side of the 2.0 deal is men are raised to believe their entire lives that if they want to have a long-term sexual relationship with a woman, they have to take your sexuality, throw it in a box, slam the lid shut, and stamp and label it as their property. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> if they don't, they can't be sure they're raising their own kids. Yeah. And in modern society, anybody and everybody that falls outside of this narrow little sex 2.0 deal, society says we have to stigmatize them and demonize them and despise them. That's right. And, I mean, it literally doesn't matter why you fall outside of this deal. You're supposed to be hated. So if you happen to be gay, society calls you a a fag or a dyke. Mm -hmm. If you happen to be a heterosexual woman not really interested in selling her sexuality in exchange for security, but you have a normal, healthy sex drive anyway, and you want to have sex anyway, society calls you what? A slut. Exactly. (laughs) Either a slut or a whore, depending purely on whether you give it away for free or sell it. Right. (laughs) If you're a heterosexual man and you're not really interested in the 2.0 deal, society says you need to man up and settle down and stop being so damn immature and do the right thing. Yeah. If you get a job as a porn star, again, you're not following this X2.0 deal. So essentially, the collective term for all of this bullying and coercion that society places on people that fall outside of the sex 2.0 deal is uh, something I call relationship duress. Right. That's the collective term. So one of the big negatives in terms of moving from 1.0 to 2.0 is the creation of relationship duress. Probably the second big one, I would say, is we introduced a schism into human sexuality. In 1.0, we just followed our sexual nature. Mm -hmm. There are 8.7 million species of creature on the planet. And in 1.0, this is what we had in common with all of them. Mm -hmm. Because all the other species on the planet, they just follow their sexual nature as well. Right. And that's what we did in 1.0. But when we moved from 1.0 to 2.0, we added a second dimension to human sexuality defined by the word normal. Yeah. Now, in 1.0, we only had one dimension defined by the word natural. And when we moved from 1.0 to 2.0, we became unique on the planet. And I don't mean this in a good way. We became the only species on the planet that has two planes of sexuality, natural and normal. And the key thing to understand here is that these two dimensions of sexuality operate at the same time. Mm Mm-hmm which means you can have something that is normal and at the same time is not natural and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So an example, the obvious example of something that is normal but is not natural would be marriage, for example. Right. Marriage is 100% normal, but it's not natural at all. We've been, on the question of whether marriage is natural or not, we've been outvoted by all of the other creatures 8.7 million to one. Which is kind of a landslide vote. Well, okay, okay. So, but w- it could, marriage is natural or not? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, couldn't we have evolved into? So, you're basically saying that we are, as humans, we're not natural monogamous. Well, that- I mean, the the word monogamy is a 2.0 word. Okay. This is this is one of the problems with uh, language. Like I said earlier, the the oldest written word is only 6,200 years old. Yeah which is pretty much in the middle of the sex 2.0 era. So language, by and large, evolved during the sex 2.0 era, which means we use all these 2.0 words to model and describe relationships and human sexuality. The word monogamy itself is only about 400 years old. Uh Although it's 400 years old, it only came into popular usage uh, around the time of Victorian England. In other words, the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's essentially a Victorian word, and it's a Victorian concept. And this is another problem with 2.0, because as a framework, it's not sustainable for the simple reason that it's not compatible with human sexuality. In order for a framework to be sustainable, it has to be designed taking, you know, to go back to the design thing, it has to be designed taking into consideration two things. Number one is that human beings are natural pair bonders. Mm Mm-hmm. 
In other words, you know, we see each other, we're physically attracted to each other naturally, not because society tells us we should be. We fall in love naturally. Why do we have sex? We have sex because we enjoy having sex. It's an intrinsic drive. It's an intrinsic desire. Right. We fall in love naturally. We become infatuated naturally. All of these, this is intrinsic pair bonding. This is what we always did. Right. So number one, human beings are natural pair bonders. And number two is that human beings are not sexually exclusive for life by nature. So by being natural pair bonders, are you saying that they're with one other person for an extended period of time or is it just… We tend to pair bond with people one at a time. Right. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But we're not sexually exclusive for life by nature because if we were, there would be no reason to invent marriage. That's right. Yeah. People would just meet, they'd hook up and they'd stay together for life and they wouldn't even have a conversation about it if that was human nature. Yeah. But because it's not human nature, that's why marriage needed to be invented yeah. as, a, as a system of control. So, in other words, for a, a framework of human sexuality to be sustainable, it has to only take those two th- things into consideration. We're natural pair bonders. We're not sexually exclusive for life by nature. 2.0 is not designed to take those two things into consideration, which is why it's collapsing right now. And 3.0 is designed to take those two things into consideration, which is why it works. Yeah. So before we get to 3.0, can you just talk a little bit more about relationship duress? Like what is it exactly and why it's not healthy and what could happen with it? Well, uh, going back to the two dimensions of human sexuality, natural and normal, The difference between those two dimensions of sexuality is that natural is essentially a bunch of biological imperatives given to us by nature, and normal is a bunch of social imperatives given to us by society. Yeah. In other words, the natural dimension is designed by nature and not by society, not by human beings, and the normal plane is designed by society. And it's not designed by nature. Mm -hmm. And when we moved to 2.0, of those two planes of sexuality, the only one that became acceptable was the normal plane, which means that human sexual nature became marginalized and shoved aside. And the boundaries that says, uh, you know, you must be normal. In other words, you must be um, sexually exclusive. Relationship duress and the invention of relationship duress was absolutely necessary to enforce those, these new boundaries because these new boundaries were never going to be enforced by human sexual nature. So, in yeah. other words, something had to be artificially created in order to enforce these boundaries mm-hmm. and to tell everybody, you know, forget about the natural plane of sexuality. We're not animals after all. You Ego is induced, you know, we're so much better than them. Yeah. And, you know, everybody has to go to the normal plane and you have to get married. And if you don't get married, you at least have to be exclusive boyfriend and girlfriend and be seen to be moving in that direction. Right. Because if, you, if you're not married or you're not moving in that direction, again, you know, the relationship duress kicks in and, you know, everybody has to hate and stigmatize and demonize you. Yeah, it's funny. It, it reminds me, I mean, I talk a little bit about on this show about how governments control people and, you know, through, through systems like taxation, which, mm-hmm. on the, uh, you know, when you really get into it, it doesn't make any sense. You're basically taking money for people and using it for things that they may or may not want. So it, it seems very similar what you're saying about relationship duress, which is like mm-hmm. you're kind of being forced into this system, which you may you may not agree with, but you, you kind of have to go along with it because that's what everybody says to do. Yeah, it was the best we could come up with at the time, but that was 10,000 years ago. We're a little yeah. bit more advanced than that now, and yeah. I think we understand individuality a lot more. Yeah, and that's and why… There's, there's, there's various other reasons why 2.0 is now obsolete, but I guess we'll come on to that a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's exactly why I wanted you on the podcast is because I, I really do think I agree with you that there is a better way that people just aren't seeing, and you talk about it in your book, which by the way for the listeners, uh, the book is awesome. It's Sex 3.0. It's on his website. You can order it, and uh, I I read the book in in just a few days, and it was um, it's a really great read, and you can get a lot out of it because there there's so many little details in the book that I thought were just so relevant and, you know, uh, practical and, and, you know, stuff that you can read and just say, okay, you know, do I want to do this or do I want to do that? Make, make a decision. So anyway, that was a, a little side note. But now 
okay, somebody that's looking to get move on from this the sex uh, 2.0 world, get away from relationship duress. The big thing that comes up, and you talk a lot about this in your book, is the idea of jealousy and possessiveness. Uh, and you called the two-headed mm-hmm. monster, and and that's the thing that I think is is the real sticking point with this is that how do you get rid of that? How do you not feel that? How is it possible that that you know, like you say, an unfenced relationship that you could not have those two things, jealousy and possessiveness? Well, one of the um, the other thing, uh, relationship duress is not the only thing that was introduced at the beginning of Sex Two Point Zero. The beginning of Sex Two Point Zero also saw the birth of, as you said, the twin-headed monster, jealousy and possessiveness. Because if you're told by society that you have to pair off exclusively and, you know, with the ultimate aim of getting married, essentially what that means is you're told that every single one of your relationships has to be based on the notion of sexual ownership. Mm -hmm. There's a little problem with that because the notion of sexual ownership actively promotes jealousy and possessiveness. Yeah. Actively promotes it. So when you end up with, with all of this relationship carnage and all these people, you know, splitting up, you know, for jealous, possessive reasons, I mean, in Canada, the United States, the number one cause of spousal homicide is uh, sexual jealousy, sexual mm-hmm. possessiveness. Yeah. And, you know, yet we live in a society where we're told that we have to base all of our relationships on the notion of sexual ownership. And yet sexual ownership promotes the idea of jealousy and possessiveness. Yeah. And yet we scratch our heads and we look at these statistics and wonder why. Yeah. It's completely ridiculous. It is. <laughs> I totally agree. And, but we're not allowed to – you're not allowed to blame that. You know, you have to blame, I don't know, the individual or, I don't know, drink or drugs or something else. 2.0 saw the birth of the twin-headed monster, jealousy and possessiveness. And also, I think, the corruption of love, because love is insanely simple. But I did a lot of research writing this book. I did, actually did a, a, complete round, a complete circumnavigation of the entire planet. Literally, I started in London, and I headed west and kept heading west until I got back to London, which is a trip yeah. that took me two years and three months. Awesome. One trip. <laughs> yeah. And uh, all along the way, I was bouncing, you know, sex 2.0 ideas off the people that I met in all of these different cultures and, you know, finding the unifying thread that, you know, links all of humanity despite, you know, all these different languages and cultures that I was coming across. Right. And one of the things I found which really surprised me is that if you ask people to, you know, do you have a personal definition of the word love, people find that a really hard question to answer. Yeah. They scratch their head and it's like, oh, how can you define love? It's ephemeral. It's, you know, it's something beyond definition, beyond words. And I think a lot of that has to do, you know, we as a society, we're in love with the idea of love. Mm -hmm. But yet we can't actually say what it is. Yeah. Which is a little bit weird. I mean, you you ask literally, you go onto the street and ask 100 people, you know, do you ask them the question, do you have a personal definition of the word love? People really struggle to answer that question. I actually interviewed as part of the research a whole bunch of sexologists and relationship therapists. Mm -hmm. And every single question I answered them, you know, they were able to talk, you know, they danced very confidently and quickly until I got to that question. And they're like, oh, (laughs) wow, that's a big one. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, these are professional sexologists and relationship therapists. (laughs) And they don't have, you know, personal definition. But I think that's a lot to do with at the corruption of love there's you know there's a chapter an entire chapter in the book called the corruption of love which is about how it's become obfuscated in 2.0 because i mean for me love is uh, something obscenely simple my own personal definition is i define it in one sentence love is the deep emotional need for the well-being of another person that sounds good to me it's insanely simple yeah but and that's what it was in 1.0 but in one point zero, it was different because the circle of empathy was the tribe. In other words, everybody cared about the well-being of everybody else in the tribe. But when we moved from one point zero to two point zero, we're told that our circle of empathy has to shrink to our immediate blood relatives and the one person that we're fucking, mm-hmm. and that's it. Yeah, that we're told by society that's where our circle of empathy has to be. Right, and that's not particularly human. And you see state breaks happening all the time. Like, you know, if you're walking along the street and a person walking towards you trips up and falls over and they're a complete stranger, you know, most people would say, oh, my God, are you okay? Right. Can I help you up? Most people would do that or, you know, 
you see it in the emergency situations, you know, like when Hurricane Sandy hit New York and you yeah. know, the electricity was out. And, you know, you saw these on the news reports when people were getting electricity back. They were plugging in the extension cords and throwing them out onto the street and, you know, leaving little signs, you know, charge your phone here if you need to charge your phone. Yeah. That's an example of a state break. That's human empathy returning to where it's supposed to be. Right. Which is basically everybody around you. Yeah. And you don't need to be forced. To, people don't generally need to be forced to behave that way. No, that's an example of a state break. That's an example of, you know, the human empathy circle expanding out to where it's supposed to be, which is a good sign. It means it's not completely broken. Yeah, yeah that's right. So uh, now your book, you focus a lot on the 3.0, the unfenced relationship versus a fenced one. Can you mm-hmm. talk about that? What is exactly that means? Yeah, that's it's a 3.0 term. I was I was talking earlier about how language mostly evolved during 2.0, and one of the problems with language is we're using 2.0 words to model relationships and sexuality. Fence and unfence is a 3.0 term. Essentially, what I say is there are only two kinds of relationships: fence and unfence. Fence meaning two people agree to fence in their sexuality and make it unavailable to everybody else on the planet. So, obvious examples, you know, conventional boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, conventional husband and wife relationships. Mm -hmm. Unfence simply means that there is no fence. In other words, there is no system of control. There's no enforced sexual exclusivity. Right. It doesn't mean you're having sex with lots of people. You can have an unfenced relationship with one person. Mm Mm-hmm. If you want to. Essentially means, I mean, if you're in an unfenced relationship, it means you always have the option. And whether you choose to exercise the option would be completely up to you. Right. Essentially means uh, love without control. Mm -hmm. Without a system of control in place. So without the control, then you either, would you say you eliminate jealousy? Well, jealousy is not a natural emotion. Almost everybody thinks that it is. But it isn't and it can't be as long as you understand the difference between jealousy, possessiveness, and envy. Mm -hmm. Because those are three different emotions with three different root causes. Although they are related emotions and it's possible to experience, you know, one or two or even all three of them at the same time. The root cause of jealousy is essentially it's a feeling of insecurity caused by something happened, something that you uh, thought or preconceived or assumed was your property. Something has happened, and now you're not so sure, and now you're feeling insecure. So sexual jealousy is a feeling of insecurity about a person that you assumed was your sexual property, and something's happened, and now you're feeling all insecure, maybe even sick to the pit of your stomach, and possibly mixed in with some anger. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the root cause of jealousy is insecurity based on property. Okay. Property and the notion of property is only 10,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Jealousy is a normal emotion, but not a natural emotion. Mm -hmm. Again, it's going back to the uh, the two dimensions of human sexuality. Jealousy is a totally normal emotion. Yeah. But it's not a natural emotion. Yeah, that's interesting because I talk about this book, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, and he lays out all the feelings that we have. And he talks, he says that exact thing that jealousy is not actually a feeling it's not it's a made up feeling it's like something that we constructed well i mean how can it be anything else if the idea of property is an artificial construct Mm -hmm. which it is yeah it's an invention so the notion of people as property uh, can only be an artificial construct and if you think back to the definition of love that i gave earlier Love is the deep emotional need for the well-being of another person. Right. So if somebody that you love experienced happiness without you, why would that make you angry? Mm -hmm. If you do actually love them. Right. Why? Because maybe because it doesn't fit in with your ego or your frame of uh, control that you've established. Yeah, because you grew up in the sex 2.0 world, which says that this person needs to be with you in in this relationship and nobody else because we're fenced in. And... Mm-hmm. So the idea of, of like doing something outside of that little fenced-in relationship is causes this unhappiness and, and jealousy type of thing. Well, I mean, it's it's not just that. It's basing your relationships on the notion of sexual property, which society says you absolutely have to do. Right. And if you don't do it, you're up to something wicked and evil, and you will experience relationship duress. So, I mean, if you do follow that path and you embark on fenced relationships, of course you're going to be jealous Mm -hmm. if your partner hooks up with someone else because your entire relationship is based on the notion of sexual ownership. 
that's the foundation of the relationship, mm-hmm. which is why some people have a hard time believing that jealousy is not a natural emotion because the only relationships they've been in are fenced relationships. If they were actually in an unfenced relationship and it was understood from the very beginning and it was made clear at the you know within the first you know, a week or two of the relationship that it was an unfenced relationship, they'd experience a different reality. Yeah. So at this point for you, if you're with somebody and let's say you're with them for a while, a few months or something, and then they go off and have like an affair with somebody else and you're made aware of that, is there any kind of feeling that you get? Like, is there like a twinge of like, oh, like that kind of hurts? Or is it just you know, at this point you're kind of over all that? It's not possible to have an affair in an unfenced relationship. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's not possible to cheat. In terms of cheating, the primary element, the thing that has to be present more than anything else is deception. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is some women regard, I don't know, holding hands or kissing with someone else to be cheating mm-hmm. or, or even just flirting and not even doing that. Right. So sex isn't actually a required element of uh, cheating and being unfaithful. Right. You know, different people draw the line in different places with regards to what they consider cheating. But the only element that is absolutely necessary for cheating to be cheating, for being unfaithful to be unfaithful, is deception. Mm-hmm. And there is no deception like that in unfenced relationships. There is no system of control to be breached. Yeah, so you going into a relationship now, you've got that kind of mindset. So you're not... So if something like that were to happen, there's not even a consideration that this is breaching something and that, you know, that somehow you've been violated if your partner goes off and does something with somebody else. Yeah, but I'm not pretending that this stuff is easy. I mean, if you've had a lifetime of 2.0 programming, it's it's not you're not going to unprogram it just by listening to this podcast. Right. <laughs> exactly. It, it's going to take a little more than 45 minutes to an hour. It took me about three years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That. I mean, that makes sense because it's all we're all, we're talking about emotions here and changing, kind of changing how you view these things. So now I want to get into this because it's it's really interesting to me. This idea of like an open. People always say, you know, like when I talk about this with people, they say you think open relationships are good, and I say, well, no, not really. That's not exactly where I. You know, I, I don't see that as necessarily the path that I'm going down. But when I read your thing about unfenced relationships, that made a lot more sense to me. Now, yeah. c- can you talk about, and people talk about uh, monogamy versus non-monogamy versus polyamory, and there's like differences between all three of those. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that's all 2.0 language. Okay. I actually recorded a video about this today. Oh, nice. For the next thing I'm working on, which is a, a video course, an online video course specifically about unfenced relationships and how to do them skillfully because it is a skill set. Yeah. And it's like I said, this stuff is not easy. Right. I don't like the term open relationships because shops and restaurants open and close. Mm-hmm. People are not shops and restaurants. Yeah. Shop closes, the metal shutter comes down, there's no one there. Whereas if, let's say, you're in a fenced relationship and you meet someone who's attractive, you're still going to find them attractive. Mm -hmm. And your partner is still going to find people attractive. There's no metal shutter down, you know, no one's home here. Right. Attractive people don't stop becoming attractive just because you've agreed to be in a sexually exclusive relationship. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. So the whole open relationship, closed relationship paradigm doesn't work. And if you look at it in terms of fenced and unfenced, it's a much better metaphor in terms of understanding what's going on. Because let's say if you're in a sexually exclusive relationship and you're completely faithful, but you still enjoy the attention of attractive people and, you know, maybe you'll flirt occasionally even though you won't act on it. Essentially, you know, you're leaning on the fence and you're flirting with someone that's on the other side of the fence. Yeah. But you're not hopping over the fence and you're not going to. Right. Whereas if you do actually have a a fence relationship but you're cheating – Essentially, what you're doing is you're both agreeing to be fenced, but you're hopping over the fence while your partner's a lot, not looking. Mm-hmm. So it's a much better metaphor. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah. So you, you just want to stick with those terms then and forget about all this polyamory and, and non-monogamy and stuff like that. I don't self-identify as polyamorous. Yeah. Or, I mean, other terms like swinger and polyamory, um, I can't really put that label on myself. I don't self-describe because, I mean, both of those terms, first of all, pretty much assume multiple partners, many partners. Right. But that's not what unfenced relationships about. Unfenced is about love without control. So also looking at it, 
that way it's it's helpful because relationships across decades are not static if you're in an unfenced relationship and you're in the you know the early relationship stage the you know romantic infatuation stage you know there's lots of early relationship energy bouncing around the relationship you're probably not going to be very interested in exercising your option mm-hmm. even though you have the option yeah and even though your partner has the option so you just don't exercise it it doesn't change the nature of the, your relationship from sure. fence to from fence to from unfenced to fenced just because you know this is this person is the only person I want to be with right now because you can get tricked in that way because if you say oh well this person you know I just met them we're dating the first few months I'm not interested in anybody else therefore fenced is for me mm-hmm. what you're saying is therefore a you know a system of control in this relationship is for me just because I don't want to be outside of this system of control yeah but that kind of breaks when you stretch that over years and decades because now you have a contract in place which when it's broken you two have to go your separate ways mm-hmm. pretty much i mean not everybody does but you right. know that's by and large you know when people cheat people break up sure whereas if you're 3.0 and if you're unfenced then essentially rather than unconsciously um, ending up in a fenced relationship by default because that's what you think you're supposed to do because that's what society says you're supposed to do and there's all this relationship duress. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're choosing the mode of relating to each other that serves you, not the one that's society, not the one that serves society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, I mean, if if in the beginning you, you know, you're not interested in exercising your option, you just don't. You might even choose, you can be 3.0 and you can be fenced. Mm Mm-hmm. 3.0 3.0 and being unfenced is not the same thing. In the 3.0, you get the choice of either. Right. But under 3.0, it's a conscious choice based on the mode of relating that serves you and that serves the relationship, which is far more self-empowering than just ending up with a system of control built into your relationship because that's what society says you're supposed to do and it's completely by default and it's completely unconscious. Right, right. And, and so this is one thing I've heard from a lot of people, and this is something I've experienced as well, where you start dating somebody and it, and it really works out. You have great chemistry and you find them really attractive. And then suddenly everybody else becomes much less attractive. Like you're just not even seeing, like for me, it'd be other women. Like I wouldn't even notice them. I just notice, I just want to be with this one person. So mm-hmm. I start falling into that. And that's, I think what you talk about is like the romantic infatuation. And that's where mm-hmm. I would go, yeah, fence, whatever. I'm with this person. I don't care. And then, you know, I think that what you're saying is that that could lead to just kind of falling into a fence relationship without giving it any thought because months go by and things or years go by and things change. And then all of a sudden you're like locked to this person. Yeah, and then, well, then what do I do? Oh, well, I guess I need to either cheat or split up, Mm -hmm. which kind of sucks. Yeah. (laughs) Whereas if you, let's say if you're 3.0 and you both agree at the beginning of the relationship that fenced is for you, that's something that will come out of a conversation that you have and it's a conscious choice for both of you. You know, right now in terms of how we're feeling and, you know, my personality and your personality and where we're at in the relationship, you know what, well, fenced suits us better. But if you're 3.0 and down the line, that mode of relating is not serving you so well, you know, months or years or, you know, maybe 10 years later, then you can have a conversation about it. Yeah. Then you can either try to fix what you think the problem is and stay fenced, or you can have a conversation about, you know, whether maybe uh, unfenced would serve you mm-hmm. and suit the relationship better and help you keep the relationship going, you know, or you can split up. There's far more options there. Right. Rather than saying, okay, I have to do this. I have to unconsciously enter into this unfenced relationship. And it'll keep working until it doesn't work anymore. And then I have to split up. And then I have to go on the exact same journey with another person, expecting that the destination is going to be different. Yeah. Just because the person that I'm with is different. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work. And then they try the exact same thing with another person. And that works until it doesn't. And they break up and then they try the exact same thing with another person. And this is the sex and the relationship life of many people. They get trapped into serial monogamy, which is basically just trying the same thing over and over again until it breaks. And then trying the same thing again. Yeah, exactly. There's no thought into the the, the system or, or what it is. It's it's just – it's got to work better with somebody else. Yeah, and, and in the early relationship, you know, the early energy relationship part, they, you know, people will convince themselves that, 
you know, they found the one, right? The, the mythical one. Yeah. This idea that society, which of course society is always trying to sell you the 2.0. The problem's not with the framework. You didn't break up with your last 15 boyfriends because there's something wrong with what you're doing. Yeah. Or the framework or this set of rules we're giving you. It's because you haven't found the one yet. Yeah. Those last 15 guys, yeah. I know you thought all 15 of them were the one. Right. But it turns out that they weren't, and that's the problem. It's not the framework. It's, <laughs> you just thought that they were the one. They weren't. Yeah. That's, it's, that's the problem. It's the next one. That's what society tells you. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's amazing because you could go through your whole life and looking for this mythical one and at the end of your life you're, you're just disappointed because you never found that one or you thought you did and then it wasn't the one and then you, you're just on this kind of treadmill of, of trying to get there and never reaching that destination, which, um, yeah, this is why I think your you know, Sex with 3.0 makes a lot more sense. So I wanted to ask you about the – there was something you said on your blog. There was a blog post you made about how men don't have a, a friend zone. Like, like women are – you know, there's the classic friend zone. Like you, you're trying to date somebody and then all of a sudden you're in the friend zone and you can't and it's impossible to get out. But, but you said that men don't have a friend zone, which that right there I somewhat agree with, but – my question more is is in terms of having friends of the opposite sex. Do you think it's possible to have men and women be friends without benefits? Only if they're not attracted to each other. Okay. I'm not. I'm not saying it's impossible. Yeah. But yeah, I, rem- I remember that blog post. It's to do with one of the things that that's behind all of that is that men and women's sexual imperatives are completely different. Mm-hmm. Men only have one sexual imperative and. Women used to have one back in 1.0, and when we moved from 1.0 to 2.0, they added the second one. Mm-hmm. But neither of their two sexual imperatives are identical to man's one sexual imperative. And that's the basically spreading the seed? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, men's one and only sexual imperative is to have sex with lots of fertile women. Mm-hmm. That imperative doesn't work for women because men produce sperm constantly and women produce one egg a month. Or if they get pregnant, they can only have one baby a year where men can have as many as they want. And also women stop producing eggs at a certain age. So in the sexual marketplace, sperm is cheap and eggs are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so men's sexual imperative you know, doesn't work for women. They're far better, genetically speaking, advised to seek a high-quality mate. Mm-hmm. which can mean either somebody who can provide them with physical security, like you know, strong and alpha male, somebody's mm-hmm. strength and dominance, which is why women have always been attracted to dominance, particularly sexually. And uh, the other one is a good provider male. Mm-hmm. You know, someone who's got a good job, you know. There's guys don't sit around talking about, you know, how this new girl in town, you know, what a good catch she is because she's a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah. We only, we only care about one thing. Is she hot? We don't care what she does for a job, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that because we're not going to walk down the street and see a hot girl and think, like, well, I wonder what, you know, like, I, I mean, I guess, you know, the, the first thing is the initial attraction. So the initial thing isn't to evaluate what kind of career she's in. But as far as dating or pursuing that woman, mm-hmm. would you agree that, that then those things definitely come into play? I would say following looks and whether she's hot, I think probably personality is the the second thing that comes into play. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Job, I can't think of any woman I've ever been with that I've that what she does for a living has ever come into play. Mm-hmm. No. I guess it just... Because, also because, uh, I mean, men are taught their entire lives that they have to stand on their own two feet or they're not a real man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not only are they taught they have to, you know, you have to stand on your own two feet and you have to provide for yourself, but, you know, down the line, potentially you have to provide for a family as well. Yeah. That's what men are taught their entire lives. So, you know, we're not really interested in seeking provision in that way from a female partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That that makes sense. I guess it's just more of like what makes her interesting. Like maybe it is her career. Maybe that's something that would be, is interesting. And I guess it's the difference between the one thing I've heard from women is, oh, so guys are just, just want to have sex with every single woman they're attracted to. No, generally speaking, men seek women of high sexual marketplace value. Mm Mm-hmm. In other words, we're not just interested in anything that is female. Right. We're interested in the highest sexual market value female that we can get. And that changes drastically from guy to guy because that depends on your sexual market value. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that you know, there's, there's some guys who are really not fussy at all <laughs> yeah. because, you know, they'll just, they're desperate and they'll take whatever they can get. Yeah. And, you know, the guys who, are, who have higher sexual market value can afford to be more fussy. Sure. Yeah. 
Okay, so now uh, groupthink. You you talked a lot about groupthink in your book, which I was really I, I thought that was really cool because uh, it, it I, when I read about that, I was thinking, how does this apply to like society and living in a free world, which is what I always talk about. Now, how does it? First of all, how is it poisonous to relationships, and what is it, and how is it poisonous to relationships? Well, groupthink is uh, a field of study in psychology. A lot of the work was done on the East Coast of the United States in the 60s and 70s, although I think the term groupthink was first coined back in the 1950s. And there's a bunch of different signs that groupthink is occurring. I think there's 11 or 12 of them, which I list in the book, we, which we don't have time to go into all of them right now. But essentially, groupthink means, well, this is the way we've always done it in the past, and this is the way that society agrees that we should do it. So that means that's, well, that we've got to do it this way in the future then. Yeah. We've always done it this way in the past, and everyone agrees on it, so that must mean everyone's right, yeah. and we've got to do it this way in the future. And, oh, by the way, you're not allowed to question exactly why we started to do it this way in the past, <laughs> yeah. because if you do question it, then you're immoral, Yeah. because one of the signs that group thinkers at play is the inherent belief in the morality of the in-group and the belief in the immorality of everybody that is outside of groupthink. Mm-hmm. That's essentially in a nutshell what groupthink means. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so how does that poison <clears throat> relationships? Well, I mean, sex 2.0 is, is obsolete. We're already living in a post sex 2.0 world. And the only thing that's keeping it alive is groupthink. Mm -hmm. It's stopping us from moving on because we all know that 50% of marriages end in divorce, roughly speaking. This is not a little-known statistic. This is a very, very widely known statistic. Sure. I mean, even people who aren't married but have been through the relationship, you know, the grinder, the, the mill, and have had a lot of, you know, disappointments and, you know, relationship problems and have, you know, maybe been badly let down by 2.0. People are crying out for a way that has to be different. Mm -hmm. But groupthink essentially stops them finding it. And it comes in many forms, everything from, you know, the church plays a big role in groupthink, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Governments still give tax breaks to married couples, which is essentially nothing more than a bribe. Yeah. The governments bribe people to get married. Everything from love songs on the radio, romantic comedies, Disney plays a large part. But your book, yeah. after I read your book, I started noticing some of the, like I would turn on Pandora and listen to some music and, and every song is, is about this stuff. It's like, it's amazing, uh, you know, how that is. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Well, the, I mean, 3.0, I talked about 3.0 and 2.0 and 1.0 is the three eras of mankind with 3.0 essentially being present day forwards. But to me, uh, 3.0 is not just a period of time. It's a level of consciousness. Yeah. There's very, very, very few things that unite all human beings on the planet, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, race, language, nationality, cultural background. But two of the big ones are consciousness and sexuality. Yeah. We're all conscious human beings. We're all sexual human beings. But you can have a level of consciousness about sexuality. Mm -hmm. And what I teach is that 2.0 is an extremely low level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the reason I brought this up is because if you read my book and you switched on the radio, that's an example of your level of consciousness being ratcheted up. Because if you truly understand all of this stuff, then one of the things that you notice is that every single song on the radio sounds completely ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> that's meant to be a love song? Right. Right. Exactly. That sounds like a stalker song or a codependency song. Yeah, or, yeah, uh, that's exactly. Or a jealousy and possessiveness song. Yeah. That's not. That's not love. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, as far as uh, this idea of groupthink again, can you see how it, the, there's a crossover to society as a whole? Because, like, when you were saying the the things that that unite people, I was also thinking of the desire to be free. And this kind of what you're presenting, it kind of gives an alternate viewpoint and an alternate way to look at it where you're more free and so anyway my question to you is is do you see how this can kind of harm society and in terms of the individual and kind of make the individual become less significant well i mean to answer that question you have to understand the fundamental design architecture of mm -hmm. 2.0 because we started off this interview talking a little bit about my you know my past job and my interest in design and architecture yeah and the book is essentially broken down into three acts. 
Part one is context. Part two is deconstruction. And part three is solution. So part one, context, is where I talk about some primer concepts and I talk about 1.0. So you have the backstory, you know, you have the context. That's about the first 25% of the book. Mm-hmm. The middle 50% of the book is deconstruction, where I essentially deconstruct and I pull apart relationships, specifically 2.0 relationships. And by doing that deconstruction, you basically get to see them for what they are. And once you do the deconstruction and you pull everything apart, you're left staring into the uh, the nuclear core, the heart of the design of sex 2.0, mm-hmm. which consists of only three things, fear, control, deception. Mm-hmm. 2.0 is a system of control kept in place by fear and deception. Mm-hmm. That's the heart of the design. Yeah. Control in what way? Well, marriage is a system of control. Fear in what way? Well, fear f- that men might not be raising their own children, f- Fear for women, they might be labeled a slut or a whore, for example. 2.0 is completely fear based. Mm-hmm. In terms of deception, if I mentioned all the ways in which 2.0 is deceptive, we would be here for the rest of tonight and probably all of tomorrow. Yeah. I think there's one chapter in the book I list, I don't know, 20 or 30 ways in which 2.0 is deceptive. But the fundamental deception for 2.0 is it, it doesn't deliver what it advertises and promises. It advertises itself as a high-performance framework for relationships with a low failure rate, plus the fairy tale promise of happily ever after. What it actually delivers is a low-performance framework for relationships with a high failure rate and no happily ever after. If 2.0 was a product that you bought in a shop, you would take it back and demand a refund. <laughs> it doesn't deliver what it advertises and promises. And that's where all of this, you know, this disappointment and frustration and anger and resentment comes from. When you embark on a 2.0 relationship, you are subscribing to a framework of systemic failure. Yeah. In other words, when you embark on a 2.0 relationship, your failure is built into the system. Yeah, I agree. So I would want to mention, and we'll, we'll start wrapping it up here, as I know it's been it's actually been over an hour already. So I was listening to a podcast about, and the, the guy was actually pro-marriage and giving some arguments uh, for the idea of marriage and, and how that's actually going to lead to more happiness and freedom and things like that, which I was not really in agreement with. But one thing that one of his arguments was that, well, we have to have a system to make sure that, that men know who their children are. And I know you went over this in, the, in your book, and it's a pretty simple argument, right? Yeah, I mean, essentially, well, I've referenced already the fact that 2.0 is obsolete, but we haven't really touched on the, well, the final nail in the coffin. It's partially obsolete because it never really worked very well. And I'm not just talking about the 20% rate of paternal discrepancy, right? but also the fact that 2.0 is a, like I said, it's a, it's a low performance framework. The problem is systemic relationship yeah. failure is actually built into the system. But to understand the final nail in the coffin and why 2.0 is obsolete, we need to take a look again at both sides of the sex 2.0 deal, which I mentioned earlier, the male side, the female side. If you recall, the female side was women being raised their entire lives, being told that they have to sell their sexuality in exchange for security. Mm -hmm. Well, in the modern Western world, at least, women have access to social mobility. In other words, their own jobs, their own careers, their own money. Women can provide their own security if they want to. Right. Women don't have to sell their sexuality in exchange for security anymore. For most of the last 10,000 years, they did. So that's, this is a relatively recent thing. Women don't need to sell their sexuality in exchange for security anymore. So that makes the female side of the sex 2.0 deal obsolete. Mm-hmm. If you remember, the male side of the sex 2.0 deal is men being told they have to claim a woman's sexuality as property in order to be sure that they're raising their own children. Mm-hmm. Well, in in my country, in England, back in the 1950s, we discovered this thing called DNA. (laughs) It's only as recently as the 1980s that we invented paternity testing technology based on DNA. And it's only as recently as the 1990s, in other words, very recently, that these kits became widely available in pharmacies and chemists all around the world. And today you can walk into a, a pharmacy and for less than $100 buy one of these kits. They're so simple. You can do them at home. You don't need a doctor. There's no blood. There's no needles. It's a simple cheek swab to get a a little sample of DNA. These kits are so accurate, they determine paternity with greater than 99.9% accuracy. Mm -hmm. 
compared to this clunky 10,000-year-old framework we've been using to determine paternity called SEX 2.0, which has a failure rate of roughly 20%. Right. So you compare one way of determining paternity with a failure rate of about 20%, compared to this other way of determining paternity with a failure rate of less than 0.1%. That kind of makes the male side of the sex 2.0 deal obsolete too. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. And uh, So that's what I meant earlier when I said we're living in a post-sex 2.0 world because if both sides of the sex 2.0 deal are obsolete, mm-hmm. then the entire framework is obsolete. Right. Which is great because now we get a chance to upgrade Upgrade to something that actually resonates with human sexuality and human nature again. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, right. you said the DNA testing. I ordered a kit recently, and it's it's called uh, it's a site twenty three and Me, where you can get a full on DNA analysis, and I mean it's pretty comprehensive. And it was a hundred bucks, and that's going to be sent right to my door. I just have to spit into something and send it back, and they're going to have all these results for me. So, yeah, all that stuff is readily available now. So, yeah, okay, so let's wrap it up. How do we move forward? I, I think the tough thing, and I think this is what you do, and, and I want you to talk about your new product that you're working on. Most people are still stuck in 2.0. so Pretty much everyone. <laughs> yeah, pretty much everyone. So now, after listening to your podcast and reading your book and you know going through this stuff, you start to, most people, I think, will start to get, understand this and understand that it's going to be a better way overall to look at how to do relationships. So how do you go about it then? How do you date in the world that we have now with the new beliefs? It depends on what you're looking for. It depends on whether you're, as a person, whether you're fenced or unfenced. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I haven't been on a date in the last 10, 12 years. Okay. But I exclusively do unfenced relationships, which means I don't go on dates. Yeah. Because a date is essentially a guy auditioning for the role of next boyfriend, yeah. and you know, I, I mean boyfriend in the conventional sexually exclusive kind of way, mm-hmm. and that's not a role that I audition for. So you know, me personally, I you know, I just hang out with people, and whatever happens, happens. I don't go on dates. <laughs> yeah, no, that's I, I, I love this. I'm, yeah, this is great. So yeah, when people are complaining to me about their dating woes, I, you know, I'd love to be able to sit there and say, oh, I totally relate. But oh, I totally don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm so I'm so happy not to go on dates. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I'm with you there. So now, how do you form relationships then in in, in this context? Based on mutual reward, because the word relationship doesn't mean anything other than mutual reward. Right. That's something else that got confused in the move to 2.0. People think that relationship means mutual sexual exclusivity. Mm-hmm. That's not what the word relationship means. Right. It just means mutual reward, nothing more. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, 3.0 to me, it's just a different, it's a different level of consciousness. It's a different way of thinking. And again, introducing this way of thinking to your partners and the people that you're seeing and the people you're involved with is a skill. But thankfully, it's a learnable skill. And it's one that I teach. And even if I don't teach you, you can, you know, you can read the book. Yeah. <laughs> but the important thing is to be honest. Because when I designed 3.0, I should say that the design of 3.0 also consists of three things. First of all, when I was designing 3.0, the first thing that I realized is that there is no going back to 1.0 for the very simple reason that you cannot uninvent property. Right. So we move forward. We don't move back. And when I put together the the design architecture of Sex 3.0, I also based it around three core things. And these three core things were replacements for each of the three core things in the design of 2.0. If you remember, 2.0 is uh, fear, control, and deception, specifically a system of control kept in place by fear and deception. In place of control, we have self-determination. So in other words, in 3.0, you're explained, you know, this is natural, this is normal, this is fenced, this is unfenced. And when it comes to your choice of fenced relationships or unfenced relationships, in 3.0, we say there is no correct choice. Mm -hmm. There's just the choice that's right for you. Why? Because it's your life, that's why. Mm -hmm. So in other words, 3.0 is completely based on self-determination or freedom of choice, if you prefer, instead of control. Right. So already that's a significant upgrade, I think. I think that's a significant improvement. I think so, yeah. In place of deception, you have honesty. In other words, first and foremost, we get to stop lying to ourselves and stop believing in fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And in place of fear, you have love. 
And I'm not saying there was never any love in 2.0. What I'm saying is that 2.0 as a framework is designed for fear-based love. Right. Which is kind of a design flaw because fear suffocates love. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that problem. That design flaw was removed in the design of 3.0. And you just have love in place of fear. And when I say love, I mean the deep emotional need for the well-being of another person. Mm -hmm. Because that's all that love means. So in terms of how you go about this, I mean, work on raising your level of self-consciousness in terms of this stuff. There's tons of free material on the website. Everything from – there's tons of blog posts. There's a Sex 3.0 wiki. I just started a podcast. There's only one episode so far. <laughs> I'll, I'll get more. Yeah. And the first 15 chapters of the book are on the website, available for free, along with four free videos explaining all this stuff. So there's like tons of stuff on there for free. In terms of you were asking about the product I'm working on now, uh, like I said, it's an online video course specifically for people who are interested in unfenced relationships and how to do them skillfully. Because right. again, that, that's a skill set, but it's one that I teach. So, yeah, I mean, that's how you can get yourself up to speed on it. Cool. Awesome. Well, I think we can wrap it up there. It's, uh, we've definitely gone a little over time, but it's such an interesting topic and love talking about this stuff. I love hearing about it. So, yeah, thanks, JJ, so much for coming on the show. And, again, I wanted to mention your website. It's sex3.0.com, and you can get his book there and check out all the really interesting blog posts. And So, uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on, and um, I, best of luck with the new product. Can't wait to see it. Thanks, Kevin. And I should say the easiest way to get to the website is just type sex 3.0 into Google. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because, easier. Because, I, because I use letters and not numbers in the URL of the website. Just type sex 3.0 into Google and it's like the first or the second on the, on the yeah. list. But yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. Absolutely. All right. You have a good night. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Freedom Lovin' Podcast. To break free today, head on over to freedomlovin.com and download our free guide seven practical tips to living free in an unfair